We now move on to Voronoi diagrams, which are arguably the most well-known um, concept in computational geometry and um, have many extremely useful applications in, in, in practical cases. Um, they were first seriously studied by Gregory Voronoi in 1908, um, but also sort of rediscovered by other mathematicians. So this type of diagram is also known under a few, few alternative names. Um, the basic idea is that you, instead of being concerned with the initial data points in the data set, we're actually more concerned about the data points that surround them. In a given Voronoi region, which is basically a single region that surrounds one of the input data points, defines all the points outside of the original data set, which are closer to that data point, the one that's centered in the region, than to any other data point in the data set. So you basically define regions in space that are closer to your input points than to any of the other input points. So it's the sort of the closest neighbor type of, um, type of analysis. So if you imagine, for example, um, you know, you're setting up a set of uh, grocery stores, for example, in a city, you want to make sure that you figure out which residences are closest to which grocery store and have Voronoi regions or coverage areas that are roughly equivalent for each grocery store. Um, so you can certainly do that sort of thing. You can also look at things like network coverage. If, you're, if you have a sort of a mobile network that you're trying to figure, sort out the, um, the coverage for residential zones and so on. Um, we use it a lot in uh, computational biochemistry to figure out how much space um, lipid molecules take up in cell membranes. Um, it can also be used in robot motion planning to avoid obstacles. We're going to try to um, solve a problem in three dimensions um, related to that particular application today. Um, and crucially, the Voronoi diagram, and I've mentioned this before, is the mathematical dual of Del the Delaunay triangulation. So there are algorithms that will exploit this fact and start off by producing the Delaunay triangulation and then produce the Voronoi diagram um, by, by virtue of the fact they're um, closely related. All of the Voronoi regions, so all these sort of closest, um, closest neighbor regions, are always convex without exception. Um, so this means polygons in 2D um, and polyhedra in, in, in three dimensions. Um, and this can be proven formally, although I'm not going to do it. And similar to the case of the Delaunay triangulation, no four generators are co-circular is the basic uh, requirement for algorithms to function properly. So that's the definition of general position in the two-dimensional case for Voronoi diagrams. So Voronoi diagrams have been studied extensively in the literature, um, and actually from fairly early on. So, I mean, 1975 is near the, the birth of modern computational geometry, so Voronoi diagrams were there from almost from the start. Um, there are a few different algorithm paradigms. There's divide and conquer, the incremental algorithm. Uh, now, al although log linear performance is known to be optimal, the, the incremental algorithm, despite its quadratic time complexity, is often implemented just because of the conceptual simplicity. Um, this is the case actually for a lot of computational geometry um, uh, implementations of algorithms. So even though there are faster algorithms out there, it's often far, far more practical to implement the slower algorithm um, because it's actually a, you know, a reasonably tractable set of uh, steps to code. Um, there's also the quad edge data structure algorithm, which I know very little about, and the very famous, perhaps the most well-known a Voronoi diagram algorithm in the world, which is Steve Fortune's sweep line algorithm, which basically sweeps a line from left to right along the plane and gradually defines the Voronoi regions progressively. Um, there's a bit of a sort of a wave front where you have to have a transition, transition zone as the line moves from left to right. Um, I think it can sometimes be considered um, difficult to code this, um, but it's, the code is certainly out there because that's a classic algorithm. Um, and I think Steve Fortune is actually still working at, uh, at Bell Labs where he came up with that, uh, that particular and extremely well-known algorithm. So we're going to jump right into some practical problem solving with scipy.spatial.voronoi. So this is again a case where scipy.spatial is providing uh, just a light wrapper, an API to the underlying uh, QHAL library, so the really fast C code, uh, which we can be really confident in its, its quality and its speed um, directly from scipy.spatial.voronoi. Um, so start off with a two-dimensional problem. Um, so in this case, this is actually a, a classic example from about 150 years ago um, during a cholera outbreak in London, where these blue data points, which and these are taken from Robin Wilson's uh, blog at the University of Southampton. So he's actually m sort of modernized the data from 150 years ago in, a, in, in such a manner that we can, we can work with them in a, in a computer programming context. Um, so these are water pumps shown in blue. 
and in red are fatalities at, at residences in, in the uh, Soho district of London, London, England. And what we want to do is generate a Voronoi diagram around the blue data points, so around the pumps. Um, the residences are not taken as initial input data, they're just sort of overlaying onto the, onto the final result. And the basic idea is to figure out which residential locations are closest to which pumps and then connect that back to the areas with a high density of fatalities to see if the fatalities are related to people visiting particular water pumps. So this is, a, this is actually one of the first examples of modern epidemiology. It just so happens that a Voronoi diagram was the key to, to solving this particular issue. And if we look at how the calculation is done in my example here, so I, we basically have the data loaded in at the top, and then we, we effectively use, as you can see here, scipy.spatial.voronoi to generate an instance of the Voronoi class um, with the array of pump coordinates, these blue dots, as, as, the, as the input data points. And actually, you can see that, once again, the SciPy developers have felt that Voronoi diagrams are sufficiently fundamental that we actually have a built-in function for plotting them directly. So you don't have to do any of the work. Just scipy.spatial, that Voronoi plot 2D, and add in the, it'll f just feed in as an argument, the Voronoi instance object. And I've just, I've just changed the sizes of the data points a little bit, so just customizing this, um, this automatically generated figure so it's a little bit easier for us, to, for us to see. And you can see that there is indeed one particularly suspicious pump. Uh, there's also a few fatalities outside of the, the Voronoi region that has the, you know, the clear concentration of, of fatalities. And apparently some, um, some interviews were done, and, and a lot of the people who, um, who got sick and, and, and who died outside of the, the, the primary Voronoi region actually preferred the water, the taste of the water at this, at this pump location here. So uh, some anecdotal explanation for the sort of mathematical um, confusion there. This is a really, this is a really useful application. Um, you could also imagine, for example, calculating the exact uh, surface areas of each of these polygons, which is something that we do quite often in my particular field to figure out how much space each given point in, a, in an input data set actually occupies. Now in three dimensions, the, the situation is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complicated because we're dealing with uh, basically polyhedra instead of polygons and sorting out the orders of points is a little bit trickier. Uh, so for example, you know, again, if you, if you don't know which points are uh, sort of in a clockwise or counterclockwise order with your with your data structure, it can be quite hard to handle this data in terms of calculating surface areas and plotting polygons. And unfortunately, um, scipy.spatial and therefore Qhall uh, underneath it um, is actually quite good at, at dealing with the, the proper ordering, either clockwise or counterclockwise, um, for the two-dimensional polygons for in a regions that followed of that that followed of that analysis. Uh, oh, one other thing I should mention is that these dashed lines here represent the edges at infinity. So for any input data set that you have, uh, any finite input data set, there's always going to be a boundary, right? So there's always going to be an edge to the to the diagram where points basically go off to, or where edges basically go off to infinity. So here the plotting code has dealt with it in a fairly, I think, a fairly uh, reasonable manner, but just by putting dashed lines there so that we can still see the rest of the plot. Um, but for three dimensions and above, it'll, it'll be up to you to to handle those particular um, edges at infinity situations. And sometimes in your own sort of custom implementations or custom applications, you'll have to deal with edges at infinity even in the two-dimensional case. Um, so for really large data sets, sometimes I'll just basically remove the data points on the perimeter if I can, just to avoid having to deal with the edges at infinity, but sometimes you just can't avoid that. Um, one thing that simplifies dealing with, with these, these edges at infinity is the idea that or, or the fact that actually they're indexed as a negative one within this the scipy that spatial data structure, so it should be uh, obvious when you're dealing with uh, you know with with an edge that goes off to infinity based on its based on the indices of the points. Um, so let's move on to this three-dimensional case now. So here we're, we're back to designing a, a drone. In this case, one that is going to fly in an in urban location, so in three-dimensional space, and we'll assume that it has to not only navigate from east to west, but also from, um, from sort of a higher to lower elevation, so three-dimensional, uh, 3D Cartesian uh, translations. Um, so it has to avoid both uh, stationary obstacles like tall buildings and also dynamic obstacles like hel helicopter and air traffic. 
Um, so it'll need to be able to accept uh, real-time data with it, that, that tracks the motion of those, uh, of those moving objects on top of the static data for the um, stationary buildings and so on. Um, so so the, the question basically asks for us to demonstrate an approach to determining the safest routes, where safest is defined as uh, effectively farthest from the obstacles um, for the drone in, in 3D space. And we'll also assume that just using a random set of 3D points is a suitable simulation of the kinds of coordinate data that the drone will receive in real time. Um, this isn't entirely un, uh, unreasonable, and it's also uh, quite useful to use a, a random set of points because, once again, um, random points are effectively guaranteed to be in general position, so we don't have to, to worry about uh, degeneracies in, in, in the three-dimensional case. Um, so we, we're, we're in this case, we're going to work with a random sample of uh, 50 three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. And once again, we start off by generating an instance of the Scipy.Spatial Voronoi class in this four, four object. And then we use these, um, these peculiar uh, attributes, these ridge vertices, which are basically uh, the, the indices of the, uh, the points in the Voronoi diagram, or the Voronoi vertices, um, that form connected vertices. So basically the edges in the Voronoi diagram. So in the two-dimensional context, that would be, for example, an edge between this green dot and this green dot in the Voronoi diagram. So obviously in a three-dimensional case, it's a bit more involved because you have polyhedra, but effectively you can see that the green lines here, which we're, we're plotting uh, between the Voronoi vertices in, in orange, um, these are being produced um, programmatically from these ridge, these ridge vertices um, by, by indexing the original uh, coordinates of the Voronoi vertices, pr also produced by Scipy.Spatial. Um, and basically just scattering all of the data um, and connecting these and connecting these edges to the whole data set, and we get we get a number of possible routes around various obstacles. Um, so obviously this is just uh, part of the problem. You know the exact route that you want to take would probably depend on a number of additional factors as well. Um, but we can see that actually you know this isn't a really aesthetically pleasing plot. So a lot of these points are clearly going off to infinity, and I haven't handled that in a very graceful manner. Um, so that might be a sort of a useful exercise for you to try in terms of. Um, a, uh, cleaning up these points are going off to infinity, so just putting dashed lines that stop at the boundary of the three-dimensional plot. Um, the other thing that uh, actually seemed a bit challenging was getting, um, for example, some nice transparent polyhedra around each of the obstacles, just to show uh, more clearly that we do in fact have a, a three-dimensional tessellation around the, the, the input obstacles. Um, but that also struck me as, as non-trivial because the, the sorting of the data, the data points in a three-dimensional context is normally just an input order, so scipy.spatial is just going to regurgitate those those points for the polyhedra in the order that they were input, um, and 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 so you're not you're not necessarily going to get uh, proper sorting. So that's you know that, that, that's a potentially interesting exercise, and also you know it's sort of useful to note that although these algorithms are really useful and and, and, and they're really well done, and it's very convenient to have them in in SciPy and Spatial, you'll often find yourself doing a fair bit of data munging. Uh, which is sometimes non-trivial, even after you've produced the diagram that you were that you were looking for. Um, so let's go ahead and and just check to see if the time complexity of this algorithm, and we're just going to focus on the two-dimensional version, is uh, is what we'd expect. So you know, given that Q hall, which is used underneath a hood, is is so well optimized and and uh, and worked on by experts, we'd expect it to be uh, performing at the optimal log linear performance uh, time complexity. So again, we're, this is the same benchmark, empirical benchmark scheme that I was using before. And again, if an experienced uh, computational geometer or computer scientist um, who works with algorithms was looking at this uh, particular problem of, of, of assessing the time complexity, um, they would almost certainly actually go into the source code, um, break the algorithm down into its constitutive steps, and identify the rate-limiting step as the, as the clear and ultimate determinant of, of the time complexity, the overall time complexity of the algorithm. But we're just going to do this in a, in a slightly, a slightly more sort of hands-off manner, just by uh, measuring the empirical time complexity on on this machine. Um, you, you'll probably get slightly different values on on your particular machines, but the main idea is that again, um, the growth as a function of the number of input points should be the same, irrespective of your your computer architecture. And again, we're going to use uh, scipy dot spatial that optimize, or sorry, scipy dot optimize the curve fit to fit the different possible time complexities. And linear, log linear, and quadratic. That should cover um, sort of the most likely outcomes. And if we look at the results, we can see that yes, 
uh, you know, fits to either linear, log linear, or much closer than the quadratic time complexity. And because we know that log linear is, is theoretically optimal, there's really not much room for improvement from an algorithmic standpoint. Um, there might be some room for improvement in terms of the low-level language implementations. You might, get, you might be able to reduce the values of some of the constants, but the fundamental growth rate in terms of the amount of time as a function of the number of input points is at its absolute theoretical uh, maximum.